It is a film that has solidly stood the test of time to remain a true classic. Quintessentially British and yet universal in its theme, it is a film about heroism, about ingenuity and about courage. Or rather, a stiff upper lip in the face of adversity. It is the story of the brilliant minds who came up with an innovative way to fight the enemy in World War II. A bouncing bomb that could break the dams in Germany, striking at the heart of the Nazi war machine and about those brave men who carried out the mission to deliver that decisive strike. Now, 63 years since it was made and 75 years since the events on which it was based, the film has been lovingly restored, paying tribute to the talented and innovative minds behind the making of the film. With new, previously unpublished material from behind the scenes giving us new perspectives on the film, we delve into the story of the making of the Dambusters. In 1943, the news broke that the RAF had bombed three key dams in the Ruhr Valley, Germany. The press and public hailed Operation Chastise as a triumph against the enemy, and the newspaper, The Daily Sketch, named the squadron who carried out the raid the Dambusters. It was little wonder that by the late 40s, ideas of making a film of the Dambuster Raid were already bubbling away. Hollywood was rumored to be developing a project, and Sir Michael Balkan was in discussions to make a film of the Dam Raid story with Ealing Studios. However, neither of these projects came to fruition. But in 1951, the head of production at Associated British Picture Corporation, Robert Clark, acquired the rights to a book which he thought would make a great war film. The book was a written account of the raid called The Dambusters by author Paul Brickhill. Well, we've got both. We've got Enemy Coast Ahead in the paperback version and The Dambusters. I think I've got one. Oh, there's one. All signed by The Dambusters. Not all of them, but some of them. So that's an interesting copy, isn't it? Brickhill had been a journalist in Australia before World War II, learning his craft by writing pieces for the Sydney Sun. In 1940, he joined the Royal Australian Air Force and trained in Canada and England to become a fighter pilot. He went on to fly Hurricanes for 274 Squadron and then Spitfires for 92 Squadron. But in 1943, he was shot down over Tunisia and captured by the enemy and sent to a POW camp. This experience of the POW camp would end up being the subject and setting for Brickhill's first solo published book, The Great Escape, which was also turned into a film that many may recognize. He wrote the three most well-known British war books, um, all in a period of about five, six years. He wrote The Great Escape and The Dambusters almost simultaneously. In fact, he was working on the two books at the same time. And then he wrote um, Reach for the Sky in 1955 or 56. He wrote, I think, one novel um, in the 60s, and that was his last book. And he managed to live for the rest of his life, I think, on the, on the royalties that he made from the, the three best-selling um, war books. And, of course, the film treatments that came from all of them, the films that came out of all three. Though the film The Dambusters was initially based on Brickhill's book, the script also took great inspiration from Enemy Coast Ahead, written by leader of Operation Chastise, Wing Commander Guy Gibson. Ah, here it is. This is the account of the Dams Raid as written by Guy Gibson, the man who led the, uh, the, the Lancaster's 617 Squadron against the Ruhr Dams in 1943. Enemy Coast Ahead was one of the two books that the Dambusters film was actually modelled on, uh, the other being Paul Brickhill's uh, The Dambusters. Guy Gibson was a public icon after his participation in the war. He was also, at one point, the most decorated serviceman in Britain, and at only 25. But in 1943, Gibson secured his legacy as one of the most famous pilots in history. After three operational tours, Air Vice Marshal Cochrane and Air Chief Marshal Bomber Harris asked Gibson if he would help form Squadron X for a secret mission. Initially, without knowing the specific details himself, Gibson accepted and crew from other multi-tour squadrons were brought together to create 617 Squadron. 
this squadron would take part in Operation Chastise, what would later be termed the Dambuster Ray. Despite the heavy losses they suffered on the mission, for which Gibson felt deeply responsible, Chastise was hailed as a huge success, and Gibson became a national hero, receiving the Victoria Cross. He then moved into press duties and PR for the Air Force. Among these duties was a press trip to Canada and the United States, where he happened to meet famous film director Howard Hawks. Hawks was secretly planning to make a film about the dam raids himself and had hired Roald Dahl to write the script. But ultimately, the reluctance of Bomber Command and Barnes Wallace to divulge secrets of strategy to a Hollywood studio meant that this didn't come to fruition. Dahl wrote a, a, a screenplay for Hawks um, and sent it over to London to be looked at by people involved in the dam raid, presumably Gibson, Barnes Wallace, and everybody was horrified with it. They, didn't, they thought it was far too um, melodramatic, I suppose is the best way of putting it. Barnes Wallace in particular was particularly upset by uh, the way his, his character was portrayed. The Air Ministry was very keen for Gibson to write a book about his own experiences, and taking a posting that gave him more time, Gibson sat down to write Enemy Coast Ahead. Unfortunately, he didn't get to see the book published. After seeing the D-Day landings and the war continue without him, Gibson requested to return to active duty. On September the 19th, 1944, returning from a nighttime bombing run over Germany, Gibson's mosquito bomber crashed in the Netherlands and he was killed. He was only 26. Enemy Coast Ahead was published in 1946 and was a bestseller. Strangely, one of the alternative book titles Gibson had initially suggested to his publishers was The Boys Die Young. Now that production had acquired the source material, they needed a scriptwriter. Robert Clark hired British playwright R.C. Sheriff for the job. Sheriff had written the screenplays for Claude Rains' The Invisible Man, The Four Feathers, and Goodbye Mr. Chips, among others. But it was Sheriff's play Journey's End, based on his own experiences of combat in the First World War, that originally brought him to the attention of the public. It was likely that his real-life experiences made him such a good writer of natural dialogue and believable characters, especially in stories of battle and war. In terms of who might play these real-life heroes, Robert Clark had always envisioned the film as being a vehicle for one of their best actors under contract at ABPC, Richard Todd. Todd was hot on the heels of his Oscar-nominated role in The Hasty Heart opposite Ronald Reagan, and was well known for roles in Hitchcock's Stage Fright, as Robin Hood in the story of Robin Hood and his Merry Men, and Rob Roy in The Highland Rogue. But The Dambusters would be Todd's first modern war movie, taking on the challenge of playing the national hero and co-author of the source material, Wing Commander Guy Gibson. Like the authors of the film, Richard Todd was not unfamiliar with real-life combat. Volunteering for duty in 1939, like so many, Todd put his acting career on hold to join the army and later became a captain in the parachute regiment. In 1944, he was among the men who parachuted into Normandy on D-Day with the 6th Airborne Division and took part in the famous operation to capture the Pegasus Bridge alongside Major John Howard. Many years later, Todd would play Major Howard in the war film The Longest Day, which recreated that battle to take the bridge. People in Britain knew that Todd had actually served in World War II. He'd had, a, he'd, he'd had a very creditable service record. And I suppose the way he plays Gibson is as a man who needs to get a job done, and there is a heroism about it, but there's something very understated about, about him. He doesn't have to shout and yell. And in fact, when he's telling his men to get on the planes, we're ready to go, he just says, come on then, and that's it and there's something rather impressive about the fact that that's the way he, that's the way he approaches it. It's a job to be done. Richard Todd understood the military mentality, he understood military discipline, he understood the nuances of military language and deportment and how you conduct yourselves. So as uh, the, playing the part of Guy Gibson in the Dambusters film uh, would, would have been a seamless transition for him. Alongside Todd in the Dambusters, 
Michael Redgrave was to be cast as the other lead. Redgrave was a classical stage actor and in 1954 had already been given a CBE for his acting. He would later be knighted. Although he was never fond of being called a film star, he had only a few years previously won Best Actor at the Cannes Film Festival for his role as the retiring schoolmaster in Anthony Asquith's brilliant film adaptation of the Browning version. In The Dam Busters, Redgrave would embrace the challenge of playing someone 10 years his senior, the revered inventor of the bouncing bomb, Barnes Neville Wallace. Michael Redgrave um, went to met Barnes Wallace. They, I think they got on quite well. Um, and um, was quite conscious of that he was paying um, a living person. I think Redgrave saw in Barnes Wallace that here is a particular type of man. He's driven. He's eccentric. He's basically unstoppable. He has an idea in his head, and he will not let it rest. Before the war, Barnes Wallace worked on aircraft design at British plane builder Vickers, designing airships and later the clever, basket-like geodetic structure used in the Wellington bomber. When war broke out, Barnes Wallace became involved in trying to improve bombing operations of the RAF. The enemy was defending against attack in more and more inventive ways, and Wallace began devising innovative ways to get around these defences. One such defence was to use giant torpedo nets surrounding warships, preventing divers and torpedoes from getting through, but not over. But you were friends with um, Barnes Wallace. So oh, yeah, absolutely. So the only time we went back to a comfort was with Bean, and uh, July the 7th, 1976. This is a copy of Enemy Coast Ahead, um, which Barnes Wallace signed for me. He said to me, Mr. Hetman, where would you like me to sign the book? I said, right across the dam there. One day, whilst thinking back to his memories of skimming pebbles on a pond with his children, Wallace came up with the notion of skipping a bomb on the surface of the water, bouncing it over the nets. He began rudimentary tests using marbles catapulted across a tin bath full of water in his garden. He discovered that a perforated sphere, much like a modern golf ball, traveled much further than a smooth sphere, but also that using backspin on the projectile, it would not only go further, but it would also slow down enough for the aircraft to reach a safe distance away from the blast. Wallace also realized that using backspin would mean that when the bomb finally broke the surface, it would drop and not carry on. And this could have application to destroying something other than ships, namely dams. The Air Force had little success in busting dams using conventional bombing, as even with a direct hit, which was very hard to do, the force of the water behind the dam would help absorb the shock of the blast. By dropping a bomb down the inside wall of the dam, an underwater explosion would combine with the force of the water and break the wall, busting the dam. Though many have argued about the extent to which Operation Chastise was considered a success, one thing is certain. The effectiveness of the bouncing bomb itself is without question. Barnes Wallace went on to create other innovative technical and engineering designs for aeronautics, including other successful bomb delivery systems. However, after chastise, Wallace was deeply affected by the deaths of the men from 617 Squadron, whose planes failed to return. He made a conscious effort never again to endanger the lives of air crews involved with his inventions. It was about people like Barnes Wallace, um, who had that breadth of, uh, uh, of imagination. You know, he's only one man, but he had so many different ideas. Uh, and the fact that he sat down and thought about this problem, you know, I need to do something, he felt, for the war effort. Um, I need to try and, and do something unusual, something really dramatic that will, will benefit uh, and bring uh, the, the war to, to a, a close quicker than perhaps a a sort of a war of attrition, which is what it was turning out to be in 1942. To direct the Dambusters, 
Robert Clark recommended a young and eager director called Michael Anderson, who was under contract with ABPC. Clark saw the film as being the biggest war film ever attempted, but at the lowest price possible. This scale and limited budget would require the skills of someone exceptionally resourceful and undaunted by the challenge. Anderson read the script and was up for the challenge. Michael Anderson had started out as a runner at Elstree Studios and went on to be assistant to many great directors such as Anthony Asquith, who directed Pygmalion and the Browning version, and the Bolting Brothers, who made Brighton Rock and Seven Days to Noon. Anderson also worked with the great man himself, David Lean. It was whilst Anderson was working with David Lean on In Which We Serve as a production manager that he received his call-up papers for war. Lord Mountbatten himself recommended that Anderson finish his duties on the film before being shipped out. He was obviously a big fan of David Lean's films. Anderson would later say that whilst assisting these great British film directors, he learned an invaluable lesson. Surround yourself with the best people. And of course, he did just that. Anderson treated the production in the same way as the raid, with meticulous planning, preparation, and military precision, surrounding himself with amazing cast and crew and making sure that every detail of the film was as realistic as possible. To this end, he made the choice to shoot the film in monochrome, despite the fact that color was an option. He felt it was essential to give the film more of a gritty documentary feel, and they could use actual footage of the planes and bombs spliced into the film to add realism. Very much influenced, I think, by the, by the wartime documentary films. And Anderson worked, I think, in the documentary units during the war, learning his craft in the wartime. I'm sure that his style of shooting is influenced by that. For the sequences over the Ruhr Valley, uh, it looks like it looks like documentary footage. There's nothing um, distracting about it being in black and white. It looks like a period piece, which it already was when the film's released, and that seems to work very well. One of the great benefits to the production was having the real-life participants of the raid on hand to tell Michael Anderson what it was really like at the time. The RAF gave their blessing to the production and Group Captain Charles Whitworth, who was the wartime station commander at Scampton, became technical advisor and gave Anderson all the support he needed. Barnes Wallace, too, had read the script and gave his full approval. But what was important to him was to ensure every little detail was as accurate as it could be. Of course, there were things that the production couldn't show in the film as they were still deemed classified. When the production came to film the actual planes in flight, they also had to create a fake bomb attached to the Lancaster planes used in the filming in order to not reveal the shape of the real bouncing bomb, which might reveal its secrets. When it came to making the film, the bouncing bomb, as it had been used during the Second World War, was still on the secret list. What they did uh, was to build um, a mock-up uh, of the shape of the bouncing bomb, which was not actually a true, a true representation, but rather a plywood and plaster of Paris reconstruction. But it was actually very good visually on camera because it accentuated the bulge underneath the fuselage of the aircraft. They had to go back through the test film footage and actually paint out frame by frame the actual shape of the bomb that was being used. Um, to obscure that and to obscure the fact that it was actually back spinning. In the actual dam raid, 19 Lancaster bombers were used, but for the film, the production could only get hold of four flying Lancasters, along with a Vickers Varsity twin engine and a Wellington bomber, both used to film the aerial sequences. One of the issues in securing the Lancasters was that this particular bomber had been withdrawn from service in 1950, replaced by its larger sister, the Avro Lincoln bomber. Many of the Lancasters were scrapped for parts to replace bits and pieces in other planes, but the production managed to pull four planes out of retirement from nearby RAF Helmswell. Despite gruelling weather and a challenging aerial shoot that ran on for some time over schedule, almost all of the crew were still taking part in active duty. Fresh from Operation Bold in Malaya, pilots from 83 and 97 Squadron, who had flight time in the similar Lincoln, were recruited to the cause of helping with the film. Flight Lieutenant Ken Souter from 83 led three other pilots, 
Flight Sergeant Joe Kamichik, also 83, Flight Lieutenant Dickie Lambert, and Flight Sergeant Ted Sowalski, both from 97. Both had escaped from um, the uh, Nazi invaders um, early on in the war and made their way around the world to get back uh, to England to join the fight against, the, uh, against Germany. Um, both those pilots had operational flying experience during the war years, so there were a number of people involved, not just cast, but the men who flew the airplanes, the Lancasters on the film, who actually had first-hand experience of combat. Ted Sowalski and Joe Kamichik were just two of the hundreds of Poles who escaped occupied Poland during the war and risked their lives to travel to the UK and join the RAF. But these are guys who already demonstrated their uh, their qualities. They'd probably fought in Poland, they'd moved to Romania. From Romania, they'd taken ship to France. They'd fought in the Battle of France in 1940. They'd escaped from France to Britain. They'd, they had the same sort of battle that Brahms Wallace did to convince the establishment that they were perfectly capable of doing the job. You also, of course, have got New Zealanders and Australians and Canadians, which shows you how diverse Bomber Command was um, uh, at that time, and it got more so. On one of the first days of filming with the Lancasters, director Michael Anderson wanted to get one of the most impressive shots in the can the shot where one of the bombers flies low over the head of Richard Todd. It was a shot that required perfect timing between Todd and the Lancaster pilot. They caught the shot perfectly, but just out of frame, because it was flying so low, the Lancaster's tail wheel caught the roof of a nearby hangar. The officer from the control tower ran out shouting, you told me they would be flying low, but that's going just a bit too far. One of the big problems in shooting the Lancasters in flight was that even the dangerously low height of 60 feet didn't look that low on film. On camera, it photographed more like 200 feet. In some cases, the film pilots had to go down to 30 feet in order to capture the look of low flying. We walked in and we said, uh, we've come to get a parachute, we're doing the flying unit, everything. And the bloke in there said, parachute. He said, it ain't going to be no good to you. He said, at the OIT, you're going to fly it. He said, you wouldn't have time to pull a ripcord. <laughs> Pilot Ken Souter at one point flew so low over one of the lakes that the propellers drew up water spouts into the blades, and there were at least a couple of occasions when they clipped trees and landed to find foliage caught in their wheels. Some of the crews actually asked what would happen if one of the aircraft went in and crashed during the filming. Uh, to which Associated British replied, we can the film. Although Michael Anderson was able to get some second unit footage of the actual Ruhr Valley, the aerial photography of the planes flying low over the water was shot in Windermere, in the Lake District, and over the Derwent Valley Reservoir. The dam at Derwent posing as a pretty good stand-in for the Moan Dam, having similar turrets either side of its dam wall. Although the production shot most of the takeoffs and landings at RAF Hemswell, many of the ground exteriors of the base are at RAF Scampton, where 617 Squadron was based for the actual operation. Scampton was a 24-hour operational airfield, which is why it was only really used for flying operations at the weekend with the film. Another airfield that was used um, nearby was um, RAF Curtin in Lindsay. Uh, which was a grass airfield, and it resembled very closely the type of airfield that Scampton would have been in 1943. At Elstree, set builders recreated interior locations with meticulous detail. This included the offices of Bomber Harris, Gibson, and Barnes Wallace, and Five Group's underground operations room from where chastise was planned and overseen. This five-group operation room was actually sealed up at the end of the war, but the RAF allowed the production designers on the film to access it, photograph it, and recreate it at Elstree in fine detail. It was this detail that typified the production of the film, bringing across a true sense of realism to the audience that the filmmakers wanted to achieve. Even in casting, director Michael Anderson wanted to hire actors that resembled as best as possible their real-life counterparts. He almost certainly achieved this with Guy Gibson's part, those who knew Gibson saying that the likeness of Richard Todd to Gibson was uncanny. 
Barnes Wallace was aghast that someone as young and good-looking as Michael Redgrave could play him in the film. But such was the mastery of Redgrave's acting, combined with the simple aging makeup, that the transformation was remarkable. However, for the part of Sergeant John Pulford, Anderson was struggling to find someone who looked even remotely like the real man. That is, however, until he went to lunch with Redgrave and one of his theatre friends. Anderson was struck by the similarity of this young actor to the real-life Pulford. Desperately hoping he was able to act, Redgrave assured Anderson he was indeed an actor, and a very good one. His name was Robert Shaw. The Dambusters would be the first major film role for the actor who went on to play such iconic characters in films such as Jaws, From Russia With Love, and, of course, a return to the skies in The Battle of Britain. But Robert Shaw wasn't the only fresh young face soon to hit the big time in the Dambusters. In a blink-and-you'll-miss-him role, a young Patrick McGowan can be seen playing a guard. Ironic, as, of course, he would later be much better known as number six in The Prisoner. Coincidentally, in an episode of The Prisoner, the same character, number six, was also played by Nigel Stock, a co-star of McGowan's in The Dambusters. Stock played flying officer Spafford and would go on to become a stalwart of British film and TV, also appearing in Brighton Rock, The Avengers, and the film of another Brickhill adaptation, The Great Escape. Other familiar faces include George Baker, who played Flight Lieutenant Maltby. Baker later played Inspector Wexford in the Ruth Rendell Mysteries. Richard Thorpe, playing squadron leader Maudsley, who later appeared in TV's Emmerdale Farm for over 20 years. As a family, we sort of adopted George Baker because he played our uncle, so we would watch out for him in other things. He'd turn up sometimes in, he turns up in a James Bond film, and everybody said, oh, look, there's George Baker. And so we would always be looking out for him as a family when we saw him. He became our sort of adopted uncle, I suppose, because he played our uncle in the film. It was a very early opportunity for quite a good few young actors to make their mark. There's George Baker, there's Nigel Stock, these are people who became quite famous, you know, if not on film, on TV, and they're very familiar faces now, and there they are. Gil Taylor was second unit cameraman on the Dambusters, shooting a great deal of the aerial photography and a lot of the amazing miniatures of planes and dams in the film. They built the dam in the studios, and the, we put a track right into the dam and put a crane on the track and all the approaches to the dam are done on this crane. Bell Stewart was the operator sitting on the crane and I was grip on the crane and as we got to the flying towards the dam I then heaved, heaved the camera up and that was the effect of the aeroplanes going over the dam and pulling away after they dropped the bomb. Gill went on to become cinematographer of such iconic films as Ice Cold in Alex, Doctor Strangelove, Flash Gordon, and, of course, Star Wars A New Hope. But he was rather closer to the material of the Dambusters as he actually trained as an air gunner on Lancaster planes. The RAF soon realized his camera skills could be put to good use, and Gill was tasked with filming lots of aerial footage throughout the war with the Bomber Command film unit. So it's maybe no wonder that the aerial footage in the film is so good. Gil Taylor had first-hand knowledge of filming the actual war. He's interesting because um, he had a very distinguished career. Most notably, he was cinematographer on the first Star Wars film. What's interesting about that is that there are sequences in that first Star Wars film that even at the time people sort of mentioned Raids look, look almost like a sort of, you know, space age dam bust as well. There was a reason for that, and Gil Taylor was that reason. The use of miniatures and back screen projection was key to the film's action sequences. Each of these shots had to be done before everything else, so that when it came to shoot the scenes of the crew inside the planes, the footage of what was going on outside could be superimposed into the shot. 
Miniature work was vital in recreating the dam busting and the planes that crashed or were shot down. Some of the miniatures for the Ruhr Valley measured up to 300 feet long and filled entire sound stages at Elstree. There was also a great deal of water involved in these miniatures. The production actually filmed some of the miniature work in the same giant water tank at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington that Barnes Wallace used 10 years before to test models of the bouncing bomb. Going down to Teddington to the laboratories there, uh, where they were doing the, we were doing the testing down there. Or oh, no, not doing the testing, it was done there, but we were doing filming down there with uh, and these tanks. Um, it was interesting indeed, and that's when Barnes Wallace came down, but I didn't, I didn't, had, I didn't have any conversation with him. Today. It's obviously, you could see he was a man who had some charm. Despite reenacting the most dangerous parts of the bombing raid in miniatures and mock-ups, this didn't remove the danger from the actual planes in the film. The Lancaster pilots and their crews and those flying the camera planes pushed their aircraft to the limit of what could be done and captured footage that was groundbreaking for the time. After the film was completed, Air Vice Marshal John Whitley wrote a letter of praise to the station commander at RAF Helmswell, stating, I know this meant a great deal of time being sacrificed by both air and ground crews. Their only reward could be that they were taking part in a picture which might possibly do much to enhance the prestige of the RAF, and that this will have been the result of all their good work is now beyond a shadow of a doubt. The hardest thing to find, I don't know really. It's, um, I suppose the um, eight sheet um, the poster. poster, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, the chances of finding another one of those is unbelievable. When the film was completed in 1955, it was given a Royal Command premiere. In the audience were the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, the crew involved with the film, some of the survivors of the original bombing raid, Guy Gibson's father and his widow Eve, and Sir Barnes Wallace and his wife. When the Dam Busters uh, had its premiere in London, they invited um, the surviving members of 617 Squadron to attend the premiere, which was very uh, a very appropriate thing to do and um, really puts into perspective, this is a film, but of course these events actually happened and they were very, very serious and they had long-lasting consequence. It seemed like a fitting tribute to these very brave people. It was a prestigious event and the film was received with great enthusiasm. It was also the first time audiences got to see on screen the way the famous dam-busting raid was carried out. Until the film came out, the general public didn't know that it actually was how the bombs were delivered. And so it was a bit of a shock, a bit of a surprise, a bit of an ooh-ah factor, I think, when the people suddenly realized oh, that actually happened. That's how it actually happened. It was also the first time the public got to hear the score to the film, which included a little piece of marching music by composer Eric Coates. <laughs> Coates was approached by the filmmakers on numerous occasions but he kept turning it down, disliking the whole process of scoring for films. It was only when the director and Associated British Pictures pressed upon him that the film was of significant national importance that he decided to hear them out. When they asked if he felt he had something in mind, he replied, yes, I think I finished it yesterday. Unbeknownst to the filmmakers, he had been developing something, partly an exercise in emulating marching music forms like the Pomp and Circumstance marches by Edward Elgar that would fit the film perfectly. It would become the iconic Dam Busters March. Over the years, it has been played at celebrations, sporting events with brass bands, orchestras, and on cinema organs.
it's one of these pieces of music that's got the magic that can uh, excite people. It's automatically, as soon as you hear it, as soon as you hear the, the opening strains of it, people know, and, and, and you can see them change because uh, they're ready for it. It's just a very stirring piece of music. It's very rare you can get a piece of music that will suddenly, just by the opening chords, bring people round to it. Perhaps most importantly, the piece often accompanies RAF celebrations and parades. It has gone into the pantheon of great British musical pieces, standing as testament not only to the film, but also to the people involved in the original raid, the men and women who served in the Royal Air Force, and even to the pride of being a Briton. This is about immortality. This is 617 Squadron, the Dam Buster's immortality. This movie, we will be watching this movie in 50 and 100 years' time. We will remember the heroism and the innovation and the just sheer guts of all these people that were involved in it. That's why the movie is really important. The Dumb Busters film has gone down in, uh, in cinema history, and uh, not only cinema history, but in, in British popular history is perhaps one of the, the best known and best loved uh, films of the 20th century. Just everything about the film is well thought out. It's serious. It's rather solemn in some ways. It's not what you would call a happy ending, but it's a deserved ending. And I think people over the generations have really responded to that. Now, over six decades since it was made, the magic of the film and its message has endured. And now, with new technology at our disposal, the film has been lovingly restored frame by frame to its original glory, hopefully ensuring that a new generation and generations to come will get to appreciate this wonderful piece of filmmaking and the story of 617 Squadron, the story of the Dambusters. The final sequences of the film are probably among the most poignant of the whole production. Redgrave playing the part of Barnes Wallace, asks Gibson if he's gonna get any sleep after the night's operations, and Gibson uh, turns to him and says, I've got some letters to write. And uh, he turns his back and slowly walks away into the distance until he's lost to view. 